This is Vanessa from His Infinite Mercy Ministries and today's message is titled Half Truths and Full Lies. Satan has moved into the church. I'm delivering a message on the once saved, always saved belief which is frightening, a half truth that is deceiving and seducing the body of Christ. I'm going to quote a lot of scriptures today for you to read and study for yourself. I'm going to open up in First Timothy chapters 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The modern day seeker friendly church is Christianity's biggest enemy. This is where Satan has moved into operating within the body of Christ. The popular belief that once saved, always saved is completely untrue. The modern day seeker friendly church teaching that to secure our eternal security, we just need to say the sinner's prayer once, then we have grace and we don't need to do anything else. This is not scriptural. It's disturbing and I'm broken hearted knowing that so many Christians have been taught this law. They believe it and they live it. The scripture that is most commonly referred to is John 10 verse 28 and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Jesus here is talking about his sheep who know him, who hear him, who know his voice as the shepherd, they listen and follow and they obey him. Now, of course, no one can snatch us out of Jesus' hand. To snatch is something that happens quickly. No one can steal us and take us away from Jesus. He will never allow that. But we can put ourselves outside of his hand. He loves us so much. And that love he has will never force us to stay in his hand. We have been given free will to always choose. Therefore, we can choose to remove ourselves and he will allow it. Jesus says in John 15 verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. The definition of abide is accept or act in accordance with a rule. Comply with obey, follow, conform to, accept, acknowledge and adhere to, agree to, pay attention to act in accordance with the rule. We can see here salvation is not unconditional. Every promise of salvation in scripture has a condition. If we fulfill these conditions, the promises are ours. So here we unmistakably can see that we need to abide in the Lord God. We need to obey and follow and act in accordance to what Jesus is teaching and warning us about. If we don't adhere, there are consequences to disobedience. Colossians 1 verse 21 to 23 says, And you who were once alienated as enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. Here we can see there's a condition again. If you continue in the faith, 1 Timothy 1 verse 19 says, Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. In other words, by rejecting a good conscience, they have made a shipwreck of their faith. Hebrews 3 verse 12 to 14 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. There's another condition. If you hold steadfast to your confidence as it was from the beginning to the end. The definition of steadfast is unwavering, committed, devoted, dedicated, constant, true and loyal. Second Corinthians Chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We receive our salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are then transformed by the renewing of the mind. We should be living a new and clean life before God, a changed life, a transformed life. 
a new creation, a new creature, not conformed to the world, but transformed by a mind that is renewed. And it's pleasing to God, acceptable to the God of all creation. Are you a new creation? Are you a new creature? Or are you the same old as before? When we make a conscientious decision to live clean and change lives, knowing it pleases our Father, it means giving up what pleases our minds and what pleases our bodies. It's not easy. It's not an easy choice, but it's a free choice to make. We lived a life conformed to the world, blending in beautifully. We pleased and were acceptable to the standards of the world. But now we choose to please God. We swim upstream instead of downstream with the rest of the world. It is a continuous, daily, sacrificial decision to have a renewed mindset through sanctification in Christ. The definition of sanctification is to make holy, to set apart as sacred, to consecrate, to purify. In Ephesians 5 verse 26, here Paul is talking about the body of Christ, about the church. And he says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. First Thessalonians 4 verse 1 to 3 says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion and lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this, ma ma in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. It is giving us what pleases God, giving up what we love and what, what the world loves. We choose to live a life that is set apart and pleasing and acceptable to a holy God. We will be faced with continual trials and with rejection and terrible persecution. Hard decisions will need to be made and we will, we will need to separate ourselves from things and from people who are not good from us. Very difficult but very necessary. It's not easy living a life separate from the world. That is why it's called a living sacrifice. Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In our day-to-day -day living, we can draw from the, from the Lord's strength and by meditating in His Word day and night. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates day and night. We know that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. If we genuinely repent, there is always forgiveness in Jesus Christ. But there is danger in repeating and continuously yielding to the same sins or temptations over time. Most certainly a hardened heart will set in. When repetitive sinning behavior occurs, we are not as sorry as what we were the first time we fell into sin. And it becomes easier and easier. We become more and more distant from God and eventually over time we separate ourselves from com completely from His presence. We have departed from God and we have put ourselves outside of His hand. The good news of the gospel is that we don't need to repeatedly fall into, t into temptation. We can look to Jesus and follow by His example. We, he who knows about temptation and was tempted just as we do by the tempter, the accuser, Satan, the devil. He suffered every temptation that Satan put before him. As it is written, he overcame all temptation. 
Yeshua HaMashiach can help us overcome when we are weak. We can find our strength in him. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. There is a false sense of security that this once saved, always saved, incorrect doctrine gives. Seeker-friendly modern-day churches and their false teachers are incorrectly teaching the body of Christ that it's, it's perfectly okay to sin. We're human, but we have grace, and every sin is already forgiven, and we need to do nothing. This is half-truths, a little leaven. Satan has moved into these churches and deceiving people into believing the lie of once saved, always saved, eternal security is a done deal in a single prayer. Wow! Corrupting and deceiving the minds of many babes in faith all over the world. Yes, absolutely our sins are forgiven and washed in the blood of Jesus. But we need to come to the cross. We need to get to a place within our hearts and acknowledge that it's not okay to continue to sin. To go against the will of God and ignore his warnings regarding disobedience. We need to acknowledge, we need to acknowledge this and repent to receive for, forgiveness. Knowing our eternal salvation and entry into the kingdom is at stake. Our everlasting life is at stake. We have to be ready and prepared because at any moment we can stand before Almighty God. Are you ready? We have to separate from sin and set ourselves apart from anything or anyone that will cause us to be defiled, to separate and distance us from Father in Heaven. We have to turn away from filthy way. We cannot live the same filthy, shameful lives as we previously did. Knowing the truth and continue to steal or lie or live a life of homosexuality or think it's okay to have or condone abortions. This is murder. And I can continue with a dirty list. If we think God is okay with us, well, let me tell you this. The Bible, the word of God is there and it's clear. There are consequences to continue in sin and habitual sin. When, when you have heard and know the truth, know this, you have no excuse. Because James 4 verse 17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. These days there is no need to preach on the gospel. Once is enough. Salvation is a sure thing and eternity is secure. Much focus is spent on the prosperity gospel. Pastors ignoring all scripture where the penalties of sin lead to death in fear of causing an offence. In fear of their churches diminishing in sight, they avoid any scripture that upsets the homosexual, that upsets the drunkard or the fornicator or the adulterer. It upsets the idolater or the thief or the liar. I mean, after all, we're only human. Jesus loves us and accepts us just the way that we are. I mean, after all, he made us this way. These are lies. And this way of thinking needs to stop. It needs to stop. Pastors are more and more sounding and becoming like motivational speakers, preaching on how to get the promotion or the fancy car or the partner of your dream or the trip to your favorite destination. Well, I will say this, fear on judgment day shall be for those calling themselves pastor who have dressed the bride of Christ like a prostitute to attract carnal men. They will be ac held accountable. Pastors need to minister on the true and full gospel. To minister on sin and the consequences of sin. On habitual sin and giving in to temptation. On heaven and hell. All this left unspoken will ultimately cause us to distance ourselves from God and which could lead to spiritual death. Philippians 2 verse 12 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling 
Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. This is in Second Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christians will sin, but the key is to quick repentance and to strive to become holy through daily sanctification. Day and night spending time with the Lord, quality time in the presence of God. To believe that a Christian can li live any way he or she likes and still be saved is untrue and very dangerous. In fact, it's terrifying to think. And some say that a true Christian would never sin. Well, that is also impossible. As much as we try, we do sometimes fail and we do fall short. But we are saved by God's grace and he knows our heart when we come before him acknowledging our sin in true repentance, seeking forgiveness and strength to change, to change our ways. The reason why we must repent is because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where we can find eternal life. So for those who believe the lie, once saved, always saved, I tell you this, is, it's a lie brought into the churches by the enemy of God to destroy our everlasting life. Galatians 5 verse 9 says, A little leaven spoils the whole lump. You only need a little yeast to spread through to leaven the entire dough. Just a little leaven. A slight incl inclination to error by a few false teachers leavens and perverts the whole conception of salvation and faith and works and misleads the entire church. Matthew 7 verse 13 to 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by in it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few find it and make it through. Why? You would have to have been on the narrow road to begin with not to make it. It's a difficult and hard road, a mini detour to a wider, easier road which seems right as many are on this road. You think that you're on the right road, but you are not. That's why Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 says, Few find it. Find what? The entry to eternal life. Jesus speaking in Revelations chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither hot or nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Why does God say he will vomit out lukewarm Christians? Surely you would have had to have been in him to be spewed out. The meaning of a lukewarm Christian is you say that you're in right relationship, but you are living like you are not. You claim to be a believer and outwardly appear so, yet you are not committed. Spiritually, you are useless. Meaning to vomit out is to reject something with disgust. It's vile. Repelled by the taste, it's an inward rejection. Why does Jesus say in Matthew 13 verse 21, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he distrusts. He stumbles and he falls away. If we cannot lose our salvation, why does Jesus teach this? This is abandoning the one who is the source of salvation. The thing about the parables is that there is no middle ground. You either committed or you're not. You're either hot or you're cold. You're either a sheep or a goat. This puts lukewarm Christians in a very precarious position. Lukewarm Christians don't want to be saved from their sin. They want to be saved from the penalties of sin, of their sin. Jesus is a useful fire escape, not a God who is worshipped. 
What is worship? Is there life on earth more than eternity spent with the Father in heaven? A life so structured that they never have to live a life of faith and the fruit of good works is not evident. So if you're not in a place where you feel a desperate need, a desire for God in your life, a need that is so bad that you would rather die than be without God. If you are not in a place, then you are in a place of spiritual danger, an extremely dangerous place to be in. Don't give God your leftovers. He must be first. Give him your best. To think that we can never lose our salvation is biblically incorrect. Don't get to a place of complacency. This produces lukewarm Christians and it anesthetizes us to the repercussions of sin. Now for me, the following scripture is the key scripture to how, how we get saved to everlasting life. Jesus speaking in John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word believes is continual. We need to keep believing in him to have everlasting life. Jesus doesn't use the word belief in a singular once-off. Specifically, he says believes. In order not to perish, we need to keep believing in Jesus Christ. That whoever consistently and continually believes will have everlasting life. The definition of believes is to accept that something is true, especially without proof. To be convinced by, to trust, to have confidence in, to regard as truth. In Mark 13, 13, Jesus again speaking, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Endures to the end shall be saved. The definition of endure is suffer something painful or difficult. To last, to live through, to hold on, to abide, to continue, to persist, to remain, to survive. We need to survive, to persist, to abide, to hold on to the end. God loves us and that is why he gave us the gift of free will to choose. To choose to continually follow him, to continually abide in him. To worship only Him and love Him completely. It's a gift from God that He gives us freedom. Freedom to love Him as a child loves his or her father. To think we can do as we please and still believe eternity is secure because we prayed the sinner's prayer once is a lie. Once saved, always saved is a lie or, or originating from the serpent's tongue. Jesus said to His disciples, to His followers, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If it does not matter whether we love him or not, follow him or not, loyal to him or not, obey him or not, keep his commandments or not, why would Jesus tell us to do so? I believe that God says what he means and means what he says. I also believe that the Bible is truth. I believe it to be the word of God. If we have to doubt that he doesn't really mean what he says, then we don't have that we don't have to endure to to the end to be saved or that we don't have to continue believe and abide in him to have everlasting life well then we have to doubt every scripture throughout the entire bible every book genesis to revelation beginning to end we have to doubt everything the existence of god the trinity jesus the life and death of jesus the death the burial the resurrection judgment Salvation, we have to doubt the prophets, we have to doubt the creation of Adam and Eve, heaven and hell. We have to doubt absolutely everything. But I believe it all and I believe the entire Bible to be the truth and in its entirety, I believe God means every word of it. You see, we cannot cherry pick. It's all truth or it's all a lie. It's your choice, but I suggest you choose wisely. Salvation and your eternity are at stake. Once saved, always saved is Satan's best kept secret in cheating us out of our salvation. Out of our eternal life spent with God our Father. Mark 8 verse 
Verses 36 and 37 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Only followers of Jesus Christ, only obedience of Jesus Christ, possess eternal life. Sin not only defiles, it could lead to spiritual death. Jesus needs to be placed first in our life, before our family, before our friends, before our work, before our children, before our spouse. Because Matthew 10 verse 34 to 39 says, do, Jesus speaking, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I, for I come to set a man against his father. A daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He, will, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, salvation of your souls. That's 1 Peter verse 1, uh, chapter 1 verse 8. If your argument is that we are saved by grace and not by works, you should keep in mind faith without works is useless. And you can read that in James Chapters uh, 2, verse 14, all the way through to 26. Maybe your argument is that God doesn't take back his gift, he freely gives. Yes, but we can give that gift back. Maybe, maybe you're saying that we are sinners and we will always continue throughout our lives to sin. This is true. But it's the attitude we have about sin. We truly need to stop returning to filth and get to a place of falling to our knees in anguish before God. 2 Peter 2 verse 22, uh, 20 to 22 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the word, world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it. To them turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit. And a so having washed to washed to her wallowing in the mire there is more than one way to be wicked you can be wicked by ignoring the commandments and you can be wicked by failing to live a life for god's kingdom the first makes you wicked by the sin of commission the second by the sin of omission hebrews 5 verse 9 says and having been perfected he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him when the righteous turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity he shall die because of it but when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what law what is lawful and right he shall live because of it Ezekiel here is speaking of spiritual life and spiritual death here. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any be rooting bitterness, springing up, causing trouble. And by this many become defiled. A Christian's life should be a fight against sin and to pursue peace and to pursue holiness. People need to repent, get saved and stay saved, which often doesn't happen. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, we, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast our demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus says, 
then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The definition of lawlessness is in a state of disorder due to disregard to the law. It's rebellion. It's lack of control. It's uncontrolled behavior, not restrained. It's lawless behavior. In a flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 and 9. We as Christians need to abide in Christ and endure with long suffering to the end. God does not simply excuse and overlook sin. He is merciful, but he's also just. The sacrifice of Jesus has made it possible for God to combine both justice and mercy. You ask, how is this possible if we in the dispensation of grace? How is this possible? We are under grace and not under judgment. Well, I tell you this, grace is not the absence of judgment. It's judgment held back. There's a deep filth and a rebellion that is seeping in and, and spreading throughout the church in these last days. And simply stated, rebellion is a defiance or disobedience against authority, rebelling against God. The Greek word for disobedience comes from the same root for the word disbelief. A disbelief in God. It's described in a stubborn or a re rebellious way. The amplified version, and I'm going to read Psalm 78 uh, verse 7 and 8. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but might keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, nor prepared their hearts to know God, and whose spirits were not steadfast and faithful to God. So the Bible is clear. A man who is rebellious is a man whose heart is not right with God. And there are repercussions for disobedience. And it's mentioned very clear in the Bible. Galatians 5 verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, de jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The perfect example is, is Peter, called and chosen as a disciple, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to walk with Jesus and being taught by Christ himself, the greatest rabbi. What an honor. But how quickly we see Peter denying knowing Jesus in front of people, in fear of his life, in fear of the enemy. When he realized what he had done, the Bible says he wept. He wept before God. And then later on in the upper room, when he received the Holy Spirit, he received power and boldness. And then he faced the same people, the same authority that crucified Jesus. He ministered he was bold enough to minister to them. And when they heard this, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter, what shall we do to be saved? To have eternal life. And he told them to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus. To repent. Let us follow the example of Peter, quick to repent and realizing that we have sinned and dishonored a holy God. Even though that we, we will follow him, we, 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 we sinned. He sinned, but he, but he was quick to repent. He, he wept. With the Holy Spirit, we too can become just as bold as he was, calling man to righteousness or back to right standing with Christ. Knowing and understanding that the kingdom of God is at hand, we need to be confident that our eternity will be spent with God. 
So let us come humbly before a merciful God, weeping at the feet of Jesus, our first love, that we might be acceptable and pleasing to our husband, to Ishi, our groom. Our groom is waiting. I want to end this message with Psalms 119 verse 136. And I love this. And it's a powerful verse. And it says, rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. We need to be heartbroken. Our hearts need to be, we need to be, our hearts need to be heartbreaking because we have sinned. Because we know that others are not in right standing. They're not keeping to the law of, of God. And this is how we should feel about our family and our friends, our loved ones. We need to weep and pray for those who think that they are saved because they have, and, and believe that they have eternal life. They believe that it's secure, that they've said a single prayer, but we know that they're not adhering and obeying God's laws. We, we can see that they've been deceived by the one who roams back and forth, seeking who he may devour. They become spiritually blind and deaf by the by the truth. They become deaf and blind by Satan, the destroyer of life. Our hearts should break for those who are destined for spiritual death, destined for hell, away from the Father. May we keep them day and night in our prayers, weeping Amen. If today's message touched you, please hit the like button. Please share it. And if you would like to be updated with the latest message from HIM Ministries, please press the subscribe button to follow, to follow the ministry. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.